Thank you so much for doing that. It is not easy um, to get in front of people and, and speak, especially if you haven't done it. In fact, my very first, I think my very first large audience was right here when I spoke at the Criminal Justice Chapel back when I was a student. Um, and so it isn't easy for everybody to do it. So thank you for coming up. And we could not tell that you were shaking. We could not tell that you were nervous. So it's all stuff that's like in your head. So you can't tell that I'm shaking right now. No, I'm joking. Um, all right, so a couple things. So we're going to go through um, some Slido questions today. I'm going to go through some questions from you guys today. And I want to um, just kind of say a couple thoughts as I leave you guys. Um, and it's been a great week. I've just loved getting to talk with some of you and, and know, get to know some of you. You've made me really excited about like, some of the things that you feel like are happening in your life. And um, I, I just am excited to see where you go in the future. You never know. You might be up here in 15 years. You never know. Uh, you never know what may happen. And so I want to go ahead and just get started because I know our time is short. And the very first thing I want to do is look at the very first Slido question. Be and the question that was the most popular on Slido was, what is your favorite meme? Now, the thing is, I don't really have a favorite meme. So what I've decided to do was to give you my favorite gifts. Hopefully you don't think less of me because I'm doing gifts instead of memes. But here we go, all right? And, and sorry, I'm, I feel bad about some of these, but I really think that they're funny. And this young girl is doing a trust fall, her friend's behind her, and she falls the wrong way. You're supposed to fall backwards. That's why your friend is there. And she falls the wrong way. Yeah. I feel really guilty for laughing at kids when they do these kind of things, but they, I was cracking up in Garlock the other day when I was watching these. Um, okay, we can go to the next one. Kiss cam! Nope, not so much. <laughs> kiss cam, good old kiss cam. She was not amused at all. Nope, he needs to try again. Good old kiss cam. All right, what do we have next? Oh, this one's really bad. Yeah, yeah. I mean, she's okay. Like, she's recovered, you know. I mean, she totally, yeah, yeah. That's just brutal. I, I was like crying and garlic when I was watching this. It was so bad. I'm like, Alicia, you probably shouldn't be laughing this hard at this poor little kid that like halfway broke her neck. But I was dying. And in honor of the final one, in honor of last year's political um, scene, this is me being led to the polls in November, being dragged, begging that there's got to be some other way than to vote um, for the two options presented before me. So that's those are my favorite gifts. That was right. That was, I figured that represented a lot of people in America is what I, what I learned. Is there was a, yes, you did not have to vote. Exactly. So a lot of people were kind of torn with this last election. That's right. That's, and that's the thing. There was always other people than just two. There was always more than just two. All right. Well, there you go. There's my first answer for you. Hopefully you enjoyed those and don't think any less of me for laughing at little kids. Um, but those are some of my favorite gifts. But in regards to, to today, there's just a couple thoughts I had that I wanted to share with you. Uh, I think I may have said earlier this week that the school that I've been at the most is probably MIT. I'm actually, ironically enough, going to be there again tonight. Um, I love that university, and a lot of times people think um, it's a science, engineering, mathematics kind of place, so they would be so anti-God. Um, and they are very much like, okay, I don't know what I think about this God thing, but there are a lot of Christians that are there. There's Christian professors that are there. There's people that are willing to talk about Christianity with you, even in a science place. Um, and I'll get to science a little bit later because it was one of the popular questions that was asked on Slido. But I don't think the students at MIT see God or science. They see science works, convince me why I should think your God also works. It's kind of a more of that thing. It isn't an either or for them. Um, they kind of see science has its own principles and it has its own ways and it does its own thing. And they're like, what's the relevance of God? Um, but they're not anti it and they will engage with you in any kind of conversation that you have as long as you can bring forth good arguments or reasons for it. So I, went to, I was there a couple years ago. Um, we do this event with them where we speak about, I don't know, eight or ten times in the month of January alone. Uh, and we get tons and tons of students from all different kind of beliefs and religions and thoughts. 
And it's been great. It's very well attended. The head of the um, secular society or the atheist society, secular humanist society at MIT comes. He brings his friends. He's become a friend of mine. We have great conversation afterwards. Uh, and one of the people he brought along was a young lady who grew up in a Christian home. And she went to a Christian high school. And it was during her mom, her mom taught at the Christian high school. But it was during her time at the Christian high school where she began to question whether or not there was a God. And she pretty much walked away from Christianity in high school, but didn't tell anybody. Then in college, she was much more open now as an ACS. And I kind of dreaded her coming to my events, if I'm going to be honest, because she was a tough one to talk to. She was like, I've studied C.S. Lewis. I've, I've studied a lot of the apologetics. Like, I know a lot of these things. Um, and so she would actually be the toughest one to deal with. Not, the atheists weren't nearly as hard as her, as the kind of atheist she was, where she came from Christianity and walked away from it. And so I engaged with her. The following year, we were there again, and I didn't see her at all. And I was like, okay, well, whatever. The very last day I saw her, I asked her how she was doing, kind of chatted with her for a little bit. She invited me to come to MIT's interfaith group, which is basically people of all different kind of religions, and they kind of have a dinner, and they kind of talk, get to know each other. It was really, really cool. So glad to be invited and be a part of it. And I went to that. And then one night, a couple, maybe a couple days later, I get an email around midnight. My email goes off. I'm like, well, that's weird. So I open up my phone, and it's an email from this young girl. And I want to read you um, part of it. It's a long email, but I want to read you part of what she wrote me. She said, I have countless intellectual reasons to doubt Christianity and countless heart reasons to believe. Perhaps I'm naive or ignorant of how others live, but the love, compassion, and forgiveness I have witnessed from Christians in the past month and in the New Testament seems unparalleled. It has reminded me why I believed in the first place. Recently, I've caught myself saying, what would Jesus do far more frequently than I'm comfortable with as a non-believer? This past month, my friends and family have had moments of crisis, and when I've wondered how to be a good friend and good daughter, I've fallen back on my faith. I've looked to the actions of Christ and the original Christians to guide me. I cannot shake the feeling that something is different about the original believers. I'm convinced that they led better lives because of their faith, and I cannot shake my desire to believe. For the most part, I want to live as the original Christians did, and because of that, I've been searching for ways to intellectually justify Christianity. My issue is I must either accept all of it or none of it, which is true. I must either accept Leviticus and the Old Testament verses and what it says about different people and women and all these things, massacres and genocides, or I must reject the Bible completely but I can't pick and choose. I don't think I could ever accept the inequality of men and women, which I don't believe exists, but this is her email, um, in the Bible. I don't think I could ever deal with the Bible's stance on sexuality. I don't think I could ever accept the parts of the Old Testament where Israel wiped out entire people. I find the notion of hell to be repulsive and evil, and I've heard the arguments for it a thousand times. On the other hand, I find the love, compassion, and forgiveness of the original Christians to be admirable and compelling. I feel compelled to believe simply because of the hope that the disciples had. Yet none of these are rational reasons to believe. In many ways, I'm hopelessly agnostic. Perhaps God doesn't even exist. I don't think I can really know. I can wager an educated guess, but I can't be sure. I've studied, she says, I cannot shake my desire to believe. My head rejects the faith but my heart cannot. But I can't shake my doubts either. So here I am an atheist, living by a modified version of Christian, Christian morality, the parts I find to be good, true, and beautiful. She and I have since had a conversation. I didn't reply to the email, because I don't think you really can reply to an email like that. You've got to sit down with a person. And so we sat down for dinner at um, Chipotle, because why not? And we... Uh, we chatted, and at times she had tears streaming down her face, and I saw this young student who once was a Christian who's argued so fiercely against Christianity now at MIT 
sit there and wrestle with the fact that she really wants to believe, but she struggles with certain aspects of it. I kind of want to allow that to be something that I, or maybe the platform, the foundation with which we go through our time in Q&A here. There's lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of questions you can ask me, and there's a few on Slido that I'm also going to get to as well, because I also want to give you guys the opportunity to ask a question. But if there's something that's really pressing on you, or pressing on a friend of yours, so you may be a great solid Christian, but if there's something pressing on a friend of yours, that there's, they have an objection, or they have this thing that they can't just get over. I was speaking last night at another church, and a gentleman raised his hand and said, the issue one of my friends has is why would God allow children to die? Why infant suffering? Why child suffering? And this is why he says he can't believe. If there's something that's really, that you know that, is, that has become really dear to you or really close to you or because of your interactions or conversations with people, definitely feel free to make this be the time that we can process through some of that together. And so with that said, let me go ahead and jump into... Um, one of the questions on the slide was the most popular one in terms of there were the most variations of it and it has to do with science, evolution, age of the earth, all of these kind of things. And so um, I think it was asked maybe four times in different formats, macroevolution, um, stars and lights and, and this kind of thing. So I want to respond to that and then I'll give you guys a chance to go ahead and give, throw a question at me if you have one. Um, I don't know if this is something that, that has troubled you. I'm going to assume so because it, was, it occurred so often and so frequently on um, Slido. But this is a popular question, right? Christians, when I was growing up, there was really only one belief, okay? It was that the Bible was, you know, 8,000, about 8,000 years old. I mean, the world, excuse me, was about 8,000 years old. And that was that, Okay. Day one, day two, day three, day four, 24-hour time periods. Um, God didn't um, use macroevolution. Nobody really argues about microevolution, okay? Microevolution, small changes in species is never really something that anybody, Christian, religious, whatever, non-religious, that's not really the issue. The issue is macroevolution. Can we go from one entire species into something completely different? And, um, and so nobody, that was just kind of coming up. But nobody believed that within the church, that wasn't really a prevalent view. But a lot has changed in the last 20 years. And a lot of people have wrestled with this question of how do we know how to read Genesis 1 and 2? How do we know how to deal with creation? How do we know what to do with evolution? And so what the, one of the things I want to tell you is to understand that what evolution seeks to do is to describe how a process that, is, that has already begun functions. Okay? Evolution does not explain origins. It is not a theory of origins. It is a theory of process. How once things have happened, or once things came into being, how they evolved and changed and eventually got, pe got us to where we are today. Okay? This is very different than Genesis 1-1 in the beginning God. Okay? Those, are, those are two different kinds of concepts. One deals with origins, one deals with the process after. Okay? So that's the first thing I want to say. Second thing I want to say is this, is this is something where if you are really into this kind of stuff, I want to encourage you and let you know there's a lot of really good resources out there for you. Depending on which camp you fall into, the Christian view is actually diverse on this whole issue. Um, there are some Christians who would say the earth is very young, about 8,000 years old, and then Genesis, um, when, it's, when it talks about day one, day two, day three, day four, these are 24-hour time periods. And so evolution was not a means to which God created. So God created very young earth, and evolution was not the means to which he did what he did. He created trees, he created animals, he created people. Okay? You've got another group which would... Um, actually say, you know what? Science has demonstrated to us through a variety of different methods that we actually, the earth might be older than what we originally thought. I think right now the number is about 3.7 billion years old in terms of humans and four, around 14 billion or so in terms of the universe, that kind of thing. My numbers might be slightly off, but the idea is it's big, okay? And so what they would say is say, look, 
that doesn't really change anything for us. If the earth is old, it doesn't change anything. Um, and so they would say, maybe Genesis 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, or in terms of day 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, actually refers to a time period. In other words, what they're saying is, look, if I say to you today, I am going to go to the store, you're going to think of sometime before midnight. If I say to you, back in my day, I did blah, 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 I went to the store, you're going to think of a time period. You're not going to think, I'm talking about September 9th, 1994. Okay? You're going to think of a time period. If I say one day I will, that could mean a, a, a single day or it could mean a time period again. So what they're saying is, you know what? How we interpret that word day impacts how we view the age of the earth. Was day actually meaning a 24-hour time period, or was it 24-hour time period, or was it referring to a longer time period? And so they would say, look, the age of the earth is older, but God did it. It's an older earth, and evolution was not the means to which God created. He created trees and plants and animals and people. If you're interested in this view, you might be interested in a group called Reasons to Believe. Reasons to Believe. You could just Google them. It's a group of scientists. In fact, I think one of them is going to be here tomorrow. Roberts is her last name, um, but she's with that group. Um, AJ, but I think her first name is Angelique or something like that, but AJ Roberts, she's with them. She used to be over at um, Yale at what's called the Rivendell Institute. And it's a group of scientists, and so they'll advocate for this view. But there's another view within the Christian framework. Another view within the Christian framework says, you know what? The earth is very old. We agree with these guys. The earth is very, very old. And we believe that evolution was the means to which God created. So what they would essentially say, if I, if I understand them correctly, is that they would take a more, a less literal approach of Genesis 1, where the focus is not so much on day 1, day 2, day 3, day 4, and it's some kind of chronology, but the approach is more that God did. And what the authors were trying to communicate was that God is the creator. And so if you're interested in that kind of perspective, there's a group called BioLogos um, that you could look up. BioLogos, so L-O-G-O-S. And you could look them up. And they would believe in an older earth. They would believe that God has done it, but they would believe in evolution. So there's a variety of different views within the Christian perspective. You know where they all agree? God did it. Okay? It, the, the, the point that everybody in the Christian perspective is trying to get at is, look, we believe God did it. We're just trying to understand how he did what he did. The difference between that and the non-Christian view is they say, there is no God who did it. We understand how things have happened, but we don't know the origins yet. Okay, the scientific community does not know the origins yet. Uh, Lawrence Krauss, who was a professor at Arizona State University, wrote a book on um, a universe from nothing just recently, trying to advocate how we get a universe from nothing. The problem is he started with gravity. So everybody was like, you were started with something, and the book never received much credibility. Okay? They don't know how we get something from nothing. That's a big question. So hopefully that will give some insight into that question, as I know that's something that's come up. That was the most popular in terms of frequency on the Slido. So I want to make sure I address it. Um, and you've got a couple different groups. I think, you know what you do is you explore. You don't have to have a stance on all this yet. We're in the middle of a scientific discovery and understanding things. That's okay. It's like there's this pressure that people have to know which way things happen yet. Why? All we know is God did it. We're just trying to figure out how he did it. So what? Let's take time. Let's enjoy the discovery. Enjoy the search and see where it leads. All right. I want to turn it over to you for a question. Does anybody have a question at all? Or I can go to the next slide or one. But first, I want to give you an opportunity to ask a question. Right here. Yeah. 
Yep. Yep. Okay, so this is about a 20 minute answer, which I cannot give you. Because this is a really good question, right? I mean, this is one of the number one reasons, well, this is a popular reason why people, yeah, won't believe. And so you're right, right? Elie Wiesel in his book, Night, he wrestled with this. A lot of Jews wrestled with this. Where were you, God? We are here because we believe in you. Where are you? Christians wrestle with it. Did you, did you have something you want to add on or the second question? I have not read The Shack. I've heard about it and heard the movie came out, so I don't know if that'll be helpful or whatever. Um, but yeah, so this is a question that a lot of people want to know, right? Why, inter why, God, are you not intervening? Why aren't you doing something? You're supposed to be good. You're supposed to be powerful. You have the capabilities. Act. It's no different than what we say about um, somebody with cancer who's dying. It's no different than what we say about something horrific that has happened in your life. Where were you, God? And it's interesting to me because there's, a, there's several different ways in which we can approach this, but I think one thing I want to point out to you is that a lot of times people are really inconsistent with it because I wonder if those same people who are saying, God, where are you in World War II are the same people that are saying, God, how dare you order for people to be killed in the Old Testament? So in other words, when God, when you don't act, I am so angry with you. And God, when you do act, I am even more angry with you. I wonder if it's the same people. Because I find that those, that those people who, who argue against God's inactions also argue against his actions. And so really God doesn't win when he acts and when he doesn't act. A um, couple things I would, I would say to these people is, number one, and there's two different approaches. You can take a, a philosophical approach. If this is somebody who's lost like, a close relative. I mean, obviously it's World War II, so you're talking about grandparents maybe or something like that at this point. I would be, it, you have to be sensitive to that because you don't want to answer philosophical questions or you don't want to answer emotional questions philosophically. But a couple things you can ask them is, well, what makes it wrong? How do you know that's wrong? And make the, you know, like, in other words, they might look at you and be like, what do you mean? Like, well, if you don't believe in God, then why is it wrong? Right? Morality is subjective. If you don't have a moral being to give humanity an entire moral system through which they're supposed to live, the morality is subjective. I do what's good for me. You do what's good for you. You do what's good for you. So really, Hitler did no wrong because he did what is good for him. In fact, the shocking thing about what happened in World War II is what we saw was the natural outwork, outworking guided evolutionary process applied to humans. In other words, what, what Hitler essentially did, thanks to some of the American influence as he watched our eugenics movement, is when Darwin came up with the theory of evolution, he was talking about animals. He did a lot of animal research. Okay? He didn't dare go, and go the next step, even though he was aware of it, of what does this look like when we apply it to humans. But his cousin did. And what he created, what was called social Darwinism, which is survival of the fittest. Right? Let's, let's eliminate the weaker, and encourage the stronger and better to survive. And so essentially, that transpired into the American eugenics movement, and we created essentially abortion clinics, or we created uh, centers in which we encouraged certain people to have children and discouraged other people to have children. If you look at the history of Planned Parenthood, it started with a woman named Margaret Sanger, who was focused in on encouraging only certain people to have children. And her organization was called Planned Parenthood. And it still exists today, obviously. So if you chase the, the, the back. So Hitler saw this happening. He saw Americans sterilizing prison inmates, sterilizing those with mental health issues because we didn't want them to breed. So he says, look, humans don't have any value. If there's no God, humans have value, and he applies it to that. So my question for your friend would be, look, if you are an atheist or you're somebody who rejects Christianity, then you shouldn't have any problem with what Hitler did. This is exactly what we need to do. We want the best and strongest to survive. So number two, you also can't question God's morality because there is no objective morality. There is no right and wrong. It's subjective. So you can begin to deconstruct his, his accusation. Number three, humans don't have value because we are just the product of blind um, chance and, and, and time plus matter plus chance. Like we aren't anything valuable. We are just dust. So why should we save them? The fact that you, my friend, thinks that it's wrong to take life like that and think that humans have value actually says to me that you are more in line with the belief in God than you may realize. So now we get to why did God then allow? So those are some of the physical, philosophical things I would kind of do to make them realize that they're being inconsistent even in what they're saying. 
But then I would go on to tell them, look, the reality is, is that God isn't going to intervene in everything that we do. If I want to go up and punch one of you in the face, and God is always like stopping my arm, what's going to happen? I'm going to start to take that fist that I wanted to use to punch you in the face, and I'm going to start to raise it to him. Leave me alone. Let me do what I want. If God continues to intervene in every last situation, when we are causing destruction to other people, it's going to be more and more people that are going to turn against him. We are going to hate him. You won't let me be free. You won't let me live how I want to live. And the reality is, if God creates people with a free will, he creates them people with a free will so they can experience and choose love. But when he forces our hand, then we're only going to be starting to choose hatred and bitterness and anger towards him. So I think, why specifically did God not intervene more in World War II unless God told me, said, Alicia, this is specifically why I let it go on for four plus years, okay? But in a very general sense, I mean, I saw the point is I, I wouldn't know specifically, but in a general sense, he can't intervene at all times. He just can't. Because if he does, it's going to push people into more bitterness and more anger. And he's going to be so forceful, his hand is going to be so forceful over us as a creation that we're going to turn you further away from him. Um, so there's just some thoughts I would, I would share with you. I saw another hand somewhere. And if it's not good, yes, yeah, right here. Okay. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. It comes down to how God chose to create. If he wanted to create robots, he could have created a world in which sin was impossible. But if it's a world in which sin is impossible, it means we can only choose to love him. If it's a world where we can only choose to love him, then it's a world only of Christians. If it's a world only of Christians, then it means a world of no atheists, no Buddhists, no Muslims, no Hindus. In other words, it's a world, my friend, where you don't exist to your friend. Why did God allow Hitler to do what he did? Because he wanted you to exist. Because you, if, if, if he's prevented all these acts of evil or didn't allow for evil to happen, you yourself as an atheist could not exist. But maybe he respected your free choice and your free will that you would one day have. And so he is allowing for all people to hold these different beliefs and hold, these, hold all these different religions. But there's a cost to that. Might be something else you can share with him as well. Thank you. Anybody else? Right here. So she's saying she tried God, but she just can't believe. Can you hold that thought? I mean, I want to get to that as the very last question. Okay? Thank you. Anybody else? Was that a... Okay, go ahead. <laughs> Yeah, good, good, good. So when you say she's gay, tell me more. Like she's dating somebody? Check. Okay. Okay. No, that's a fair question. And to be honest, honest with your friend, that second half as to why is it so looked down upon, um, she's spot on with that. Okay, this is where we've messed up. Okay? 
and this is where the church has messed up, is they've said, well, I do these sins, but because I don't do those, I'm okay. I'm, I'm okay. But if you do these, oh man, like, you are just completely off the wall. Really? Do you realize that my lie and this person's murder both sent Jesus to the cross? Okay, why is it that we think that somehow we are better than other people? This is where we've egregiously messed up, and it's caused a lot of damage. It's one thing you say you, say you disagree with somebody's particular actions. It's another, th it's another thing to say you devalue them, okay? And there's no room for devaluation of anybody in Christianity. Christianity, Jesus was a great equalizer. So many teachings he had to, to raise the status of women, to give value to the lepers and the blind and those that people didn't want to go near, okay? It's a massive equalizer. So, if she, her, her original, that's just what I would say in the second part. I would acknowledge that. And if any of you have ever, if I could challenge you, have ever made somebody feel devalued as an individual, as a human being, because of their sexual orientation, I would really encourage you to call them. I know that's a wild concept now because we just text people. Call them and apologize. Just own it. Because that apology will mean more to them than you may ever, under, ever understand. But her first thing is, why would God not like me? Is that or why would God, what was the first thing? I'm sorry. Won't let you. Okay. Great, 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 great. So this whole idea of love. How do you know what love is? So, so yeah, I mean, I think this is, a, this is the question really right here. What really is love? What really is okay? Because the reality is there's a lot of things that we can love that are not necessarily good for us. Okay? We can have an overabundance of love for Coke. We can have an overabundance of love for binge-watching Netflix. We can have, oh, you didn't have to confess, but that's okay. Okay. <laughs> um, we, can have a, we can have a love for a lot of things. The reality is, is I, would, I would say that most, if not 99.9% .9 of society puts boundaries around romantic love. Most of society says it is not okay to, if you are a 40-year-old, to love a six-year-old. Boom, that's a boundary. Most of society will say it's not okay to be married to more than one person. Boom, that's a boundary. Most of society will say, maybe a little bit less of society would say, that adultery is wrong. Boom, that's a boundary. So that is we all have boundaries around love. It's not just Christianity. It's everybody does. And if you're on the receiving end of love, you really believe in boundaries. If you're, if you're a wife and your husband has cheated on you, you really believe in boundaries. So the question is, why does God seem to have go one boundary further? Because this is why. When God creates people, if he doesn't tell them the best way in which they were created or designed to function, then he's cruel and he's a monster. Imagine that a child, uh, uh, imagine I'm cooking and a child walks into the room, into the kitchen, and it's a gas stove and the flame is burning, and I watch them come over and just put their hand on the, on the burner, and I just sit there and I don't say anything to them to tell them it's wrong. What would you say to me? How dare you? How cruel you are. Look, that child can do whatever it wants to do, but if I love that child, I'm going to tell them what is best for them. What Christianity teaches is not that you are dirty or you're disgusting or whatever if you're a homosexual. It's not what it teaches. What it teaches is like, look, there's a lot of ways in which you can experience things sexually. But understand that if you, the, the only way the Bible talks about it is the best and most perfect way is heterosexually within marriage. Any other way, you can, you can, you can experience romantic love. I think two lesbians can love each other. I think two gay men can love each other. Some people may disagree with me on that. I don't. I think they can feel love for each other. But the reality is, is they're missing out on something greater. That's what the Bible message is, is that you're selling yourself short. Yeah, you're experiencing love, but you're not experiencing in the best way that you could. So it's not so much that God hates her or that God is trying to hurt her or, you know, shackle her hands behind her back. It's that he's, he has to, if he's good, tell her in, with, in the best way in which she is assigned to function. Otherwise, he's being cruel. If I give you this watch, which is pretty cheap. It's from Target. Give me this watch, and I say, enjoy it. 
Hope it suits you well. And you come back to me the next day, and the face is all cracked up. And you're like, Alicia, this watch is a piece of garbage. I'm like, what did you do to it? Well, you gave me the watch, and so I went home last night, and I hung up my painting. And I used, used the watch as a hammer, and I nailed this painting, the, the nail into the wall to hold up the painting. Like, okay, well, did your painting hang up? Yeah. Okay, well, so you used the watch to, to put the nail in the wall. Okay, that's fine. But that's not what it was intended to be designed for. It was intended to tell you time. And you can use it for other things, and it may be able to accomplish other things, but it's not what it was designed to do. And so I would tell your friend, look, it isn't so much that God is against you or he's trying to restrict you or he doesn't want you to feel love. What he's trying to do is bring clarity to your confusion on who it is that I should love. He's trying to give you the guidelines to say, look, when you feel this way, this is not the way you should go. When you feel this way, this is not the way you should go. And it's not just homosexuals, right? Remember, there is one way in which which romantic love is seen as healthy and good sexually, and that's within marriage heterosexually. There's millions of ways that we get it wrong. So he is telling millions of people, hey, this is the way in which you need to love. So when you have a desire to cheat on your wife, no, you shouldn't do that. When you have a desire to have sex with an animal, no, you shouldn't do that. When you have a desire to um, have premarital sex heterosexually, because this isn't about homosexual or heterosexual. When you choose to have premarital sex heterosexually, no, you shouldn't do that. He's given this to everybody so that they can have a better understanding of how do I live. I don't know. I didn't make me. You did. What is the best way in which you designed me to function on this earth? And so that's what I would encourage your friend in. Okay? One more question, and then I, I will say some closing comments. And then you have a question, or I can go back to a Slido one. Okay. Um, I'll do a Slido one. Excuse my napkin. I didn't have any paper and garlic. Um, so, um, God of... Okay. One of the questions on Slido had to do with the Canaanite people. Why did God command the genocide of the Canaanite people? Something like that. Have you guys heard of this question? How many of you were in the Old Testament class I did the other day? Okay, so some of you. So I should have you guys. Right. I should have you guys come up here and give the answer to that. I, <laughs> I did a whole class on this question. Um, really quickly, I'll just say a couple things because this is a much longer, longer question. Number one, genocide is, not, genocide is done because you believe that somebody is devalued or less or isn't, isn't, it has more to do with what you believe the identity of something is, okay? So if you think of Sudan, the Sudan, Sudanese genocide, you're talking about different tribes fighting against each other. Same race, different shades, <laughs> um, but, but, and, and people, but they think of one as less than the other, Okay? When you think of genocide, you think of people saying, you are not as valuable as me, you're not as important to me. That's what genocide is. What happens in the Old Testament is something very different. Okay? There's also punishment for evil. And a very, very, very quick brief answer is this. God waits about 400 years before he puts punishment on these people for the evil things they were doing. The Canaanites, I think we have the wrong idea of them. We think that they were great, wonderful, nice, lovey-dovey people. But in reality, they did a lot of evil abhorrent stuff. And it's going to get back to my friend's question here on World War II. Um, They did a lot of temple prostitution. They did a lot of bestiality, having sex with animals. Um, Incest, having sex in between a family, in between family members. The worst, to me, one of the worst things that they did was infant sacrifice. And they had a god with its arms, a statue with its arms extended like this, Molech. They lit a fire below this god and they would lay a baby across it and burn the baby alive. So they didn't hear the screams of the baby. They had a band playing in front of the baby so that it could cover the screams. So this is what they were doing. Now let's go back to my friend's question on World War II. Why didn't God intervene? When God does intervene on this and punish people for their evil and for the wickedness in which they were doing, we say, you're a monster. How dare you? And that's because we don't know the rest of the story. When you look at the Old Testament, guys, you can't just read a verse and think you know everything that it's saying. Okay? You've got to dig into some of the historical things. What are these people, who are these people like that the Bible's talking about? And you have to do some work. 
There's a whole lot more I can say on this, but I can't because of the sake of time. But just understand that the God in the Old Testament is the exact same as the God in the New Testament. He hates evil. He punishes evil. He deals with it. He doesn't let it go. In the Old Testament, he punishes people for the evil that they were doing. He extended grace and allowed them to go on for about 430 years. Grace exists in the Old Testament. Grace exists in the New Testament. He extended grace. He waited till their sin got to be so evil. And then he interjected and he put an end to it. Now, people, entire nations were not wiped out, okay? You may think that they were, but they weren't. We know that entire nations weren't wiped out because you read that about the nations still being there just a few verses later. They weren't wiped out. People were just bragging, oh, we killed them, we annihilated them. No, you didn't. Nice try, okay? They're still there. So people bragged. They didn't completely wipe them out. It was not genocide. Yes, animals had to be killed because... When you have an animal who's so used to being that intimate with a person, when you move into that area, don't you think they're going to continue to do the same thing to you? Do you want those kind of animals around? Yes, animals were killed. The God of the Old Testament is the same as the God of the New. He hates evil. He extended grace, but he hates evil, and he punishes people for what they've done. The New Testament is the same thing. He extends grace, but he hates evil, but this time he himself takes the punishment for the sin. It's exact same God, exact same God. All that changes is who receives the punishment. Um, one final note, and then I'm gonna let you guys go. Somebody asked a really good question. This is tying in with what my friend said back here. They asked this question: How do you let? How do you get your faith back after losing it? After losing it from a life experience, I want to believe, but feel like there is a block. How can you change that? How do you get your faith back after losing it from a life experience? I once believed, that, believed but feel like there's a block. How can you change that? What I want to say to you, to that person, is number one, you try again. There's only two options. Either there's a God or there's not. The only variations is of what kind of God. Either God exists or God doesn't. That's the only two options out there, guys. So just because you've had an obstacle, don't give up. Lots of Christians have, have had obstacles. Lots of people have had experiences that have gone really bad and that make us question. I've questioned. Other people have questioned. But that doesn't mean that there is an answer. It doesn't mean that, there is, that something isn't true. Let your pursuit of truth be a main motivator for you. You will never understand everything that there is to know about God. But it doesn't mean that you can't understand truth, whether or not he's there and what he's like. And so I know it can be really discouraging. I know that it can be, um, I know that it can be hard and you just want to walk away. And I know many of us have read the story of the prodigal son. You know, the story of the son who, who leaves the father and he goes and squanders all his wealth and money and then he comes home. I think for a lot of us, it's hard to be the prodigal and come home. That's really hard. It's hard to have to look back and recognize what you've done. It's hard to even feel like you can even be embraced or you can even be loved again. So for somebody who has walked away and is like, I don't know what to do, what I would encourage you to do is to grab a friend who's a Christian and be open and honest with them. Tell them if you don't like God. Tell them if you're frustrated. There's lots of staff around here. There's RDs. There's all kind of people who can, who can help you and talk with you because there is a truth out there that you can find. And don't let a certain experience cause you to miss out on knowing what really is true. And perhaps as you seek that way, you'll be able to find a better answer or a better solution to what the original answer was that made you walk away. There's a lot of things that are hard in this life, and it will only get worse, I, t I guarantee you guys, as you graduate and move on, and it will only get more painful. Um, but hold on to the message of Jesus. I tell you, as I've traveled this world and I've looked at all the different religions, I tell you that there's none other that is at the top. If Christianity isn't true, okay, that's one thing. But I would be able to stand before you and say, I don't know what else is because all these other ones have massive holes in them. So I would encourage you to continue the pursuit of Christianity. Have somebody walk through it with you. Answer those questions. And I pray that you come back. I've got to let you guys go. Thank you so much. You've been really good. Thank you all. You can follow me on Twitter.
I am now a twit. I am on Twitter. So follow me. And I will post things like cute puppies and stuff like that. 